Hello, this is Squills, and today I would like to talk to you about Varg Vilkerns and the Thulian Perspective. More specifically, I wish to discuss an article that was written on his blog in 2015. So, it's not really something that happened recently, it's not news, it's simply something that I found interesting whilst surfing the internet. For those who don't know, Varg Vilkerns is a musician, a convicted murderer, though he has served his time, and an advocate for white and European identity and traditional culture. He is also a neo-pagan, advocating a return to pagan ideas and identities which were native to Europe. Specifically, he calls himself an Odinist, which is an effort to reconstruct Norse religious beliefs and following the Norse gods. His views are deeply tied to his race and his location, and even his blog says, For Blood and Soil. It should be noted that the Thulian Perspective blog that I read this article on is no longer updated. The last article that was written on it was posted on 5-12-2016. And the article I'm going to read to you, which is titled About Islam in Europe, is from the year 2015. I chanced upon this article whilst surfing the internet and decided to discuss it. But before I do, I will give the usual disclaimers which will help you understand the perspective of this commentary. I know who Varg Vilkerns is. I've known who he is for quite some time. I'm also acquainted with his work. I have read articles he has written, and I've watched videos in which he speaks on various topics. However, I've never read any of his books, and am not deeply versed in his beliefs. I've read and watched enough to understand the perspective he has in a general sense, and am well enough versed in it to understand the core concepts. But I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on Varg Vilkern's perspectives. I also don't know if he is running a website or blog now with the same or similar name, or of a different name. I know he still makes videos under the name The Thulian Perspective, but don't really know about any sort of written articles online. The perspective I'm bringing to this, though, is going to be an academic one. This channel is not a Christian ministry, although in this particular video I will be defending Christianity, and in the past I have as well, and many people seem to think that's what the channel was set up to do. After all, I am hosting the Bible on my channel, and I do do a lot of commentary on new atheism and on theology. However, this channel was set up to be a neutral educational platform, and not a specifically religious one. I also intend on reading other things after I'm done with the Bible, including the Quran. So, I'm actually presenting these as reference, and this particular commentary is going to be framed against that context. It is a commentary based upon sociological and psychological considerations, and an academic perspective, rather than an explicitly Christian one. The channel itself is set up to be neutral, but I also need to advise you on this. Commentary by its very nature is not neutral in general. This is because a commentary is an individual perspective on a given topic. So, Unless the commentary is nothing more than a recitation of facts, at which point it can hardly be seen as commentary, it is a personal perspective. So, while the channel remains neutral, the commentaries can't be. But I always did intend this channel to host commentaries, both from myself and, if the channel grows, from others. With all that out of the way, I'm going to now describe the article and my perspective on it, and I will even read the article and explain my thoughts on it and why I thought it was an interesting topic. But before I do that, I would like to describe a little bit more about the article and how I saw it. 
In some ways, Varg Vilkerns is similar to the neo-atheists, the followers of men like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, in that he is highly critical of Christianity and heavily condemns it. He is also critical of Islam. However, I will admit that his views on the topic are better thought out than the typical new atheist. While there have been very brilliant atheist philosophers and thinkers, most in the militant atheist community are simply going to repeat the same arguments, and even the people who originate those arguments only view things on a very superficial level and get basic facts wrong, and if you know anything about the topic, their arguments completely collapse. With Varg Vilkerns, it's a bit different, because there seems to be a better foundation for what he's saying. Of course, if you know much about the topics he discusses, such as European history, you will know that his views are outside of the given academic perspective. They are outside of known history, though he argues that history has been rewritten, so there you have it. His views don't completely stand up to all scrutiny, but they are better constructed than the neo-atheist. Which is a large part of why I found this article so fascinating, because as an aspiring psychologist, I find this article to highlight a certain mode of thought. The article actually sounds reasonable on a superficial level. This is what makes it distinct from new atheist arguments. Anyone from the outside including people who are not Christian, will know that the new atheist argument is agenda-driven and not entirely reliable, while this article sounds reasoned and well thought out. Even while I was reading it, it sounded reasonable, and it's only when I thought about it that I realized that it's fundamentally flawed and its foundations are false. However, I can understand how someone can actually give it deep thought and still see it as reasonable. They just have to have a shared perspective that Varg Vilkerns has, with the same background references and the same assumptions. It's only from an outside perspective that you actually see its flaws, which can be said of many things, but that's what makes it interesting. This article could even convince people on the outside that he may have a point even if they don't join him. It presents an opportunity to look at the psychology of such people, as well as the political perspective. So, now I'm going to read the article, and I will tell you my thoughts and reasons for making this commentary after I'm done. About Islam in Europe posted on 6-2-2015. Many Europeans see Islam as a threat, and therefore throw themselves in the arms of the force they see as the only alternative to this, namely Christianity. All of a the sudden, they start talking about our traditional Christian values and our Christian cultural heritage and so forth, rejecting Islam as an immigrant religion and a threat. In reality, Christianity is an immigrant religion too and a threat to our traditional European values and cultural heritage. Christianity prevailed here in Europe from about the year 500 to 1300, replacing our European religion, we are told. Now imagine that Islam actually prevailed here in Europe, and we all became Muslims, like we once, supposedly, became Christian. Then, after some time, Let's say a thousand years, a new religion is created by somebody in the Middle East, and all of a sudden, the Europeans will start talking about our traditional Muslim values and our Islamic cultural heritage. They will defend Islam against this new threat, just like the Christians today defend Christianity. Yes, they defend not Europe, but Christianity, against Islam. I think our forebearers, who fought killed and died defending Europe and our religion, so-called paganism, against the Christians and their foreign religion, 
would shake their heads in despair had they seen how Europeans today embrace Christianity and our religion as the best alternative to Islam. What difference does it make if you call the foreign god Jehovah or Allah? What difference does it make if your savior is some rebel Jew or some Arab prophet? It is in any case a foreign religion, alien to your European nature. We are not Christians or Muslims. We are Europeans. And we have our own cultural heritage, our own values, our own laws, our own ideals, our own religion. All foreign religions are alien to us and our European spirit, and both Christianity and Islam are foreign religions. Hail the European deities! Hail and joy! This ends the reading of the article, and now it's time for me to comment on it. What I find interesting about this particular perspective is that he doesn't really look at the full picture. For example, the reason Islam is seen as a threat isn't simply because it's a foreign religion, it's because it is associated with terrorism. Now, I'm not here to say all Muslims are terrorists, or all terrorists are Muslims, or that Islam is a violent religion. I don't believe that. I believe the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful. But our society has an image of Islam as violent. Our culture has perpetuated an image of Islam as promoting terrorism because most of the terrorists we see in the news today are in fact Muslims and they are fighting for an Islamic cause. Many Muslims have condemned them and their views on Islam, but that tends to be woefully underreported and ignored. So the culture generally sees people shouting Allahu Akbar and blowing themselves up, they see planes flying into buildings, and they see cartoonists being murdered in France, they associate Islam with violence and terrorism. This, more than it just being a foreign religion, is why it is seen as a threat. And I can demonstrate that by pointing to other religions aside from Christianity that have come to Europe over the years that were not seen as a threat. Until about the 19th century, Buddhism was effectively unheard of in Europe. And then it became known, and very few people became practitioners of it. In the 20th century, though, Buddhism became vastly more popular. It never became a very large religion in Europe, or America for that matter. But it did gain a sizable following. Plus, with a new international travel, many people from Asian countries settled in Europe. These people brought Buddhism and practiced it as well. And Buddhism is a foreign religion. But no one saw it as a threat. This is because no one associated Buddhism mentally with terrorism. They instead associated it with the mysteries of the East that people were infatuated with in the late 19th and early 20th century. They also associated it with wisdom and enlightenment and peace. While it's not really true that all Buddhists are actually pacifist or live up to the ideals of Buddhism, and most Buddhists are actually normal people, the image of it, Buddhism in people's mind is one of tranquil, peaceful people meditating. The cultural image of Buddhism is simply not seen as threatening. Other new religions were also introduced to Europe. For example, Taoism, or Hinduism, and no one saw those as threats either, even though they are distinctly foreign, even though they were brought by foreigners who are not European. In fact, some Europeans even converted to these religions. Buddhism was by far the largest of the newer religions to come to Europe, but it wasn't the only one and not a single person viewed it as a threat. 
Certainly, some people who followed Christianity would argue that you should follow Christianity instead of these religions, but the Christian response to these religions was also not as, shall we say, defensive as it is against Islam. Europeans do not fear Islam simply because it is a foreign religion, but because it is a violent religion that brings terrorism. And I will remind you, that is not my view on Islam, I am discussing a social perspective. And that's sort of the issue with this article. Because it doesn't really take into account the real reason why Islam is seen as a threat. It instead posits people seeing Islam as a threat simply because it comes from outside of Europe, simply because it's new, simply because it's going to displace traditional Christian values. Varg Vilkerns is essentially arguing it's hypocritical to defend Christianity from Islam, as if the issue is about Christianity being defended against Islam, which it simply isn't. After all, defending Christianity against other religions in the past simply took the form of debate, at least within recent history. By ignoring the recent history in which Islamic terrorist attacks have become prominently known and have marred the image of Islam, especially since 2001 when the World Trade Center was attacked and fell, Varg Vilkerns effectively changes the narrative, as if people are afraid of Christianity being displaced by Islam rather than being scared of Islam itself. And that change fits the narrative he wishes to promote. He wants you, as a European, to become an Odinist. Of course, if you're not of European descent, if you're, for example, Asian, or if you are of African descent, then he doesn't want you in Europe at all. And he probably doesn't care what religion you follow, since you are not of his race. But if you're white, he wants you to follow European paganism and go back to your people. And the idea of viewing Islam as a foreign threat fits that because you can plug Christianity into the same role. Which is what he did. He posits a, a hypothetical history in which Europeans converted to Islam. And he's right, of course. If Europe had become Muslim instead of Christian, or perhaps if Christianity had been displaced either by Islamic invasion or by preaching, then we would today be speaking of our Muslim cultural heritage and our Muslim traditions and Muslim traditional beliefs and such. But so what? If France had been taken over by Spain in the year 1000 AD, and no one spoke the French language, and they all spoke Spanish, they would all be talking about their shared Spanish heritage. Does that mean that it is wrong to defend French heritage? Of course not. The problem with his example is that even if Christianity is an outside religion, it has still shaped Europe for a very long time and it actually is the root of modern European culture. It doesn't matter if it's a foreign religion. It is still the religion of the people of Europe today. Paganism is long forgotten. Indeed, even modern neo-pagans such as himself follow reconstructions that aren't truly identical to past beliefs. What he is effectively saying is people will defend what they are and what they believe in, which is true, but it doesn't really give you a reason to not defend it. If you are a European and you wish to defend our Christian cultural heritage, you are defending 
extending around 1,500 to 2,000 years of history. Depending upon what part of Europe you come from, you are defending the Renaissance. You are defending the great accomplishments of the Middle Ages. You are defending the creation of the scientific method by Christian monks. You are defending the invention of the hospital by Christians. You are defending the invention of the university by Christians. You are defending the creation of a basic law code that we follow. You are defending Michelangelo. You are defending Bach. You are defending these great people who have shaped European identity. Shakespeare, quoting the Bible, for example, or Dante's Inferno. That's what you're defending when you defend Christian cultural heritage. To abolish everything Christian means to get rid of all of that, and for what? What do the Odinists have to offer that would replace Michelangelo and Bach? What do they have to replace Dante? What can they give us to replace Shakespeare? What can they give us to replace all of this? It doesn't matter if Christianity is a foreign religion or not. Because at this point, it no longer is, and it is internalized into the European identity. Even the philosophies followed by modern atheists actually stem from and grew out of Christianity. This is why when atheists say that they get their morals from common human empathy, they're not being completely honest. Had atheism emerged in a different culture, it would function very differently than the humanist-inspired atheism of today. So even the modern neo-atheists owe a debt to Christianity and wouldn't be what they are today. And some of them will even admit this. Furthermore, people who aren't militant atheists, but, say, humanists, have long admitted this. For example, in the National Secular Society's halls, they have faces of the great moral philosophers who have shaped human culture and values. And standing with Plato and Socrates and Rousseau is a bust of Jesus Christ. So even the humanists acknowledge that humanism is an offspring of Christianity. It is an evolution from that, from that base. It grew from that root. It may be a new and distinct thing now, but it originated with Christianity and carries with it the DNA of Christianity, much like a child would their parents. When people defend our shared Christian cultural heritage and our shared Christian traditional values, they are defending a way of life that Europeans have had for thousands of years. And to get rid of that, you would lose everything that defines Europe as we understand it. Not that that would actually happen. If, by some twist of fate, Christianity was expelled from Europe along with Islam, and everyone embraced Odinism, we would retain these things, because ultimately Odinism does not have that history. It does not have a basis of culture. It is based purely on a superficial understanding of Europe's pagans of the past and upon racial identity, and you need more than that to build a world. I'm not saying Odinism couldn't develop a rich cultural heritage over a 2,000-year history as Christianity has, but as of right now, it doesn't have that. Nor does Odinism give us any reason to reject the Christianity we hold to now, and that defines Europe now, and that has defined Europe for a very long time, for approximately 2,000 years, simply because it originated somewhere else. Christianity is Europe.
at this point. And Europe is Christianity. Even as secularists try and strip society of it, it remains. You can never fully expunge it without casting aside everything that made Europe Europe. At least, Europe as we understand it. And there is no reason to see defending that rich cultural heritage as being anything but awful. If multiple world theories was true and we were able to go to that alternate timeline he speaks of, where Europe became Muslim instead of Christian, the same thing would be true. There would be no reason for the Muslims of Europe to reject Islam in favor of Odinism. If Europe had been Islamic for, let's be reasonable, around 1200 years, if for some reason Europe converted in around the 1200s to Islam and Islam became the dominant religion, then it would have produced great composers, great artists, great works of literature. Perhaps Muslims would have developed a scientific method or something akin to it. Muslims may have developed something like the hospitals. Muslims may have developed something like the universities. They may not be identical to ours. For example, we have the university system based on European guilds with three levels, Islamic culture may have not have developed that, they may have gotten something else, but they may have developed something that would be the equivalent of it, a place to go for higher education. And there would be no reason for them to throw all of that away to embrace a reconstruction of something that has been forgotten since even before people converted to Islam, because even in the alternate timeline, Christianity would have still taken root before Islam, unless Christianity just didn't spread and it was pagan, but even in that case, you still have nothing. You have no reason to get rid of the Islam that defined Europe in that alternate timeline. Furthermore, if a Christian believes Christianity is true, then it doesn't matter if it's foreign, and it makes sense for him to defend it, for he is defending what he believes in what he sees as true, and the ideals that define him. You can't just say, you should be an Odinist because prior to Christianity, about 2,000 years ago, your ancestors were pagan. Or if you're Scandinavian, around 1,500 years ago, your ancestors were pagan, so you should be pagan too. That doesn't tell you that paganism is true. That doesn't give you a reason to hold to pagan ideals. Just because your ancestors believed something doesn't mean it's true, and just because your ancestors believed something doesn't mean you have to. If that were true, then I could argue we should believe the Earth is the center of the universe because Ptolemy created the model of the universe, and who are we to question Ptolemy? It's to find our culture. I'm not going to defend the Ptolemaic universe, though, because I know it's not true. Just like people today who accept evolution. They believe it's true. And on the opposite spectrum, people who defend creationism believe it's true. They aren't defending it simply because it's a label to wear. They are defending it because they see it as true. You may have conflicts with other people who disagree or who are diametrically opposed, which is why I chose the evolution and creation example, but you still have people who honestly and sincerely believe what they're saying is true, and they are defending what they believe is true, and they are trying to convince you to believe what they believe is true. So why become an Odinist? If your only argument is, over a thousand years ago, your ancestors were pagan, then you have no argument. Does Odin exist? If Odin does exist, is he truly a god? 
What if Odin was just a king that was deified after he died? The Romans did that quite often, and the Greeks did it sometimes, too. What if Odin exists but is a demon from hell to deceive you? You see, none of those questions are answered. Rather, Varg Vilkerns just says, Your ancestors believed in Odin. You should too, as a white person. Of course, if you're black or Asian or what have you, go away and follow your native religions, but this is ours. A religion that is intrinsically tied to race, and that has nothing more going for it than race, isn't one that really sounds appealing to most people. Most people want a religion that is true. Even the atheists who say they have no religion actually follow a philosophy or worldview that is really a religion in its own right, they just don't call it that, that they at least say believe is true. While it's possible for people to claim they believe something that they don't for the purposes of agendas that are separate from it, in general, most people who follow secular humanism actually believe in it. Most people who follow Christianity actually believe in it. Most people who follow Islam actually believe in it. These religions spread not like some sort of foreign invader, but simply because people think they are true. That's not to say that all religions connected to a racial identity are necessarily going to be impoverished on an intellectual level. Both Judaism and Hinduism, for example, are deeply connected to ethnicities. But Judaism explicitly states that this is a cultural heritage of a people. Judaism explicitly states this. And even within Judaism, they don't just focus on being Jewish ethnically. For one thing, you can convert to Judaism. You can become a Jew, even if you are not ethnically Jewish. For another, if you read Jewish philosophy or religious works, you will find that Jews discuss things on a universal scale, things that they believe are true whether you are a Jew or not. They discuss universal principles of morals and values. They may discuss things from a specific racial and cultural perspective, but they do discuss things outside of that. Judaism is not purely about race. It does have a racial component, but it is not purely about that. Neither is Hinduism, which is also deeply connected to race. Some people in the West, of course, follow the tenets of Hinduism, but in India they are generally not seen as Hindus. I've heard stories of white people from Europe going to India and seeking to enter certain temples or holy places only to be turned away because they only admit Hindus, and even after explaining that they have converted to Hinduism or in some cases were raised Hindu, they are turned away because they are not Indian. But, whether or not an Indian will accept you as a fellow Hindu if you are not of his race, they will accept that you have learned truths from Hinduism. Because Hinduism, while it has a racial component, is like Judaism and speaks of things outside of itself. It preserves a cultural heritage of a people, but it also speaks of universal truths from which those cultural principles are derived. What does the modern Odinism have? From what I can tell, if you're white, you should be a pagan. 
If you're Scandinavian, you should follow Odin. And that's it. Granted, there's a little more to it, but not enough to really build on. Which also brings up another interesting point. In this article, he says that Islam is the predominant religion, and then someone in the Middle East creates a new religion that comes to Europe and people view it as a threat. As noted earlier, people don't actually view Islam as a threat simply because it's an outside religion, but because of its associations with terrorism. But what's odd about this is, it's not a perfect one-for-one -one comparison, because in our world, Islam is not a new religion. It's not like Christianity had existed in Europe for the 1500 to 2000 years, and then all of a sudden in, say, the 19th century or maybe early 20th, someone invented Islam, and now it's spreading to Europe. Islam is 600 years younger than Christianity, but at this point in time, both of them are very well-established religions. It isn't a new religion that was created. Which also brings up another point, and it's one people make all the time. Your pagan ancestors fought and died for Europe, not Christianity. When I was growing up, I heard that people died to give me my freedom. People died fighting for America. And during the American Revolution, people gave their lives fighting the British. I was never won over by that argument because, didn't the British also die? What's more, the American colonies were British. Simply dying for a cause does not make you a hero, and the arguments are only used when either you are in an in-group and you are trying to reinforce that group, or when you are appealing to someone you wish to be in the in-group so that they can identify with it through the shared sacrifice of a martyr. But in reality, dying for something doesn't make it true and doesn't give you a reason to follow it. To give a good example of that, people died for Nazis. People died for Adolf Hitler. Should we become Nazis? That's probably a bad example since Varg Vilkerns did identify as a Nazi at one time, so let's look at another example. People have died for communism. People fought and died in revolutions and battles and wars, all to defend the great communist cause and the ideals of Karl Marx. Does that mean we should become communists? For that matter, you can turn around his example, much like I did with the American Revolution example. People have died for Christianity. Therefore, we should be Christian. It doesn't matter that our pagan ancestors fought and died for Europe, not for Christianity, as he says. Because fighting for Europe, as Varg Vilkerns defines it, still doesn't give you a reason to believe in it. The Christians did the same. And if you identify as a Christian, even nominally or purely on a cultural level, which even Richard Dawkins does, Dawkins says that he is culturally a Christian, then you could point to that. People who died in the name of Christianity. You see, this is an emotional argument, and it is designed to have you feel a sense of kinship through tragedy, but in any conflict that involves violence, such as wars, People fight and die on both sides. You can't take both sides, of course. Why is it that we should become one thing and not the other based upon that? Dying for a cause does not make the cause just, as the saying goes. But in our case, it's more dying for a cause does not make the cause true. You don't give me a reason to be something just by dying for it. 
Of course, he talks about our forebearers and how they would be in despair and their sorrow at our embrace of Christianity. But how does he know that those forebearers would not themselves have converted to Christianity? In fact, in spite of the history that Varg Vilkerns gives you, they did. The pagans of Europe converted to Christianity by and large. So, would they be shaking their heads in despair? And again, can I live my life by the beliefs of my ancestors, regardless of what I believe is true? Should I believe something purely because they did? If so, I should believe in bleeding patients, if they have bad blood. Let's not forget that the human body has four humors. That is medical science. Galen said so. But what really gets me is that he talks about, does it matter if your savior is a rebel Jew or an Arab prophet? But in Islam, Muhammad is not a savior. Islam actually recognizes Jesus Christ as a prophet and as the savior. Muhammad, while considered the greatest of prophets, was still just a prophet. He may have, according to Islamic belief, given the world the final revelation from God, and he was given, of course, the pure and holy word of God that shall from thenceforth never be corrupted, but he was still a prophet. Muhammad was never characterized as a savior. In fact, Muslims would find that somewhat off-putting since, again, they recognize Jesus as a prophet, they recognize his virgin birth, and they recognize his title of Christ or Messiah. Jesus was, in fact, the Savior. It's just that in Islam, the concept of Savior is a bit different, because Jesus, according to Islam, came to restore the Jews to the true faith, because Islam in Islamic thinking, is the world's oldest religion, going back to Adam. This isn't as silly as it sounds, and one day I'll make a video going into greater detail about it, but Muhammad is much like the Prophet Joseph Smith is in Mormonism, someone who restored the truth, not someone who revealed it for the first time. Although there are a few things in Islam that are said to be revealed to Muhammad for the first time. Most of Islam is said to have been already known to man, but forgotten or corrupted. Muhammad was a corrective of all of that. Muhammad was the seal of the prophets. This is important because it seems as if... Varg Vilkerns doesn't really understand Islamic beliefs, and I doubt he really understands Christianity on a deeper level, although he probably has a firmer grasp on Christian beliefs than on Islamic ones. But not all of the Abrahamic religions look toward a savior. And finally, he appeals to our European spirit and European nature. Being a white identitarian, Varg Vilkerns believes that there is an innate quality to being white, and that the pagan religions of white people express that, and are a better fit than Christianity because it's a Middle Eastern religion intended for Middle Eastern peoples. But I don't think of either Islam or Christianity as intended to be limited to merely the Middle East. They are universalist religions which seeks converts, and there is no reason to believe that either religion could not comport with being white. Indeed, part of what makes this article sound reasonable to the people who read it is white identitarianism and European identitarianism. You see, Varg Vilkerns spends more time, not just in this article, but in other writings, 
discussing European heritage and racial identity than actual theology. Much like how the militant atheists, who claim to love science and reason but rather than discuss the newest scientific discoveries, simply go over Bible contradictions and atrocities committed by Christians and how awful God is. But at least in their case, they are talking about theology. With Varg Vilkerns, all he does is discuss essentially race. Even this discussion of Christianity and Islam is ultimately about race. He believes that you should have a religion that reinforces the white race. And that is the true nature of Varg Vilkern's writings here. He doesn't truly oppose Christianity because of its tenets exactly, although I do believe that he is sincere in his criticisms of them. But rather, his primary motive is to get rid of universalist concepts which are inherent in Christianity and a return to a religion that would make you feel more connected to Europe and your fellow white people. And again, if you're listening to this and are not white, you're excluded from that. Varg Vilkerns specifically excludes you. But think about that for a minute. Does Christianity? Not really. There have been racist Christians in the past, and some churches were exclusionary, but Christianity as a religion does not typically exclude people, neither in the ancient world or in the modern. And indeed, even in the 18th and 19th century, at the height of racialism, the Catholic Church and many other churches freely accepted people of all races. And ultimately, if you read the Bible, it says, preach the word unto every nation. It wanted everyone. But Odinism is for white Europeans. Odinism reinforces your identity as a white European. Odinism brings about white European values and identity. And that is why Varg Vilkerns holds to it, and that is why Varg Vilkerns promotes it, because it would reinforce a racial identity. I don't really have much else to say, so I think I'll sign off now. I hope you've enjoyed this commentary. Thank you, God bless, and goodbye.